Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, based on where you are on the face of our planet. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, I think pretty much everyone here knows me, but those that don't, uh, my name is Chris Sims. I'm one of the co-founders here at Havu, uh, and I'll be your guide as we go through today uh, with some phenomenal agilists from throughout the United States that I've had the honor of working with or just getting to know as we've partnered with them on some things. So looking forward to hearing from some of, again, some of the top agilists I've ever worked with. Uh, they're going to be very insightful. This is a Voices of Agility, our second one. This one is in honor of Women's History Month. So we went uh, and found some of the, uh, some women in Agile that lead with strength, insight, with passion around the agility area and within their background. And I think they're going to bring a lot of insight to those that are here today and those that will be watching the video. Uh, for those that are here, this is meant, we use this format instead of a traditional webinar on purpose. We want this to be a conversation. So please feel free to join in, ask questions, uh, get insight while we're here. Uh, we have a script-ish, but I think we'll consider it a win if we um, diverge from our script as much as possible. So I'm going to take a little bit and introduce the uh, women that have joined us today. I'm going to start with Denise Jarvie. Uh, Denise Jarvie is the Senior Director of Agile for Wesco Distribution, or just Wesco now. I don't think it's Wesco Distribution. For Wesco, uh, I've worked with Denise at, uh, we met when we worked at John Deere uh, with Scrum Inc. Uh, we can't officially say that. That is uh, publicized now uh, and have just loved working with her through that. Uh, Denise, you want to take a little bit to introduce yourself? A lot, Chris. I loved working with you at John Deere also. One of the highlights of my career, for sure, um, and happy to continue our partnership and friendship. So thanks for inviting me. And um, as you said, I currently work at Wesco. Um, before I joined Wesco, I'd never really heard of it before because it's a B2B company. It's a supply chain and distribution company, um, and it's actually a Fortune 200 company, so pretty big. And um, I'm currently leading the Agile transformation there. We have over 100 Agile teams now, um, and my job is I'm really focused a lot on the digital transformation. We're using a lot of modern technology, um, and I'm doing things like making sure that we have an alignment with our digital strategy and our business objectives. And I'm also doing a lot of work in product innovation currently um, and in my past. So lots of years of working in Agile. Um, I started out in the Army, lots of Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, contracting companies, and then kind of went back and forth between the public and the private sector, which has been really interesting. Um, and I also am trying really hard to incorporate kind of a holistic and mindful leadership in my career life. So excited to be here, Chris. Thanks. You're joining. And I'm excited to hear more about the mindful leadership and yes. uh, what that means to you. Coming from North Carolina, it is North Carolina, right, Lindsay? Uh, I know it's one of the Carolinas. North Carolina, we have Lindsay Stevenson uh, coming from TrueBridge, which is a medical record software company. Uh, Lindsay, I've had the honor of uh, training and, and working with her and had a lot of fun in, uh, where was it that Agile 2023 was? We're in Orlando, right? Yes. Um, wow. So yeah, I had a, a good time uh, hanging out with her there and in Orlando, down in Florida and uh, in Mobile since then. Lindsay, you want to take a little bit to introduce yourself? Sure. I don't know that I'm going to be able to introduce myself quite as eloquently as Denise did because she did a phenomenal job. Um, my name is Lindsay Stevenson. I've been working within Agile Principles for probably the better part of a decade at this point. Um, I currently work for TrueBridge, which is a healthcare technology company. So we have multiple different facets of what we do, but we work within the um, medical technology space. And our organization is really at the point of launching what Agile sort of looks like from their lens at an enterprise level. So 
um, Denise, you're in a great spot to be able to have so many teams sort of up and spinning and, and be able to focus on what the future looks like. We're at the, I wouldn't say ground zero necessarily, but we're at the build stage, right? So a lot of what I spend my in and out day doing is sort of bridging that gap between HR and organizational structure and what that looks like from the status of, you know, how we can use org design to support our squads and also to support our, you know, long-term product strategy and how we sort of meld the two. Um, I do a lot of training. I do a lot of, um, you know, facilitating different sessions with folks to just get an understanding of what this is going to mean and look like and feel like and taste like and all of those things for people once they get down to it. Um, so it's one of those situations where it's really interesting and exciting because every day is so very different and you really feel the ability to impact people on a very personal level because you're getting into the trenches with them and really helping to get that understanding and that buy-in of what this is going to mean for a future state. Um, and, you know, I'm very fortunate to work for a company that's very welcoming and I've got people really chomping at the bit trying to to make a change and make a difference. And so that's been um, amazing. Um, I am passionate about adaptive leadership and creating a culture of, you know, individuals who are empowered and, and not just as people have heard me say a thousand times doggies on the dashboard where they just nod their heads in meetings and go along with the flow. Um, I really am someone who wants thought partnership and to want to dig into the why behind things and not just the yes behind it. Um, and that's me. All right. And I have to say, uh, PR, your, your, your Zoom picture, every time I see it makes me so happy. That is the happiest uh, Zoom profile picture uh, ever. Uh, I love it. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, Beth joins us. Uh, she is on vacation in Florida and has chosen to spend some time with us sharing her insights, and we are very honored to have her here. Uh, Beth's focus has been on innovating in Scrum and HR, in fact, worked to create the Scrum and HR uh, credential, which is an exciting opportunity for those that want to see Scrum applied outside of the Agile Space, learn what that means. You can read more about that on our website. Beth is one of our most recent guest blog uh, authors. And Beth, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Chris. And by that intro, Chris and I have not worked together yet. I work with uh, partner McCall, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, yes, I, um, you know, much like Denise and Lindsay, um, just have found these ways of working to be very important. My career started in the late 90s in high, in technology during the dot com eras and you know back then without calling it agile we were working in a lot of these ways and so i was fortunate at a young age of my career to get to experience what it was like you know to collaborate and be adaptive and i thought at the time that that's just how it was and realized that a lot of companies weren't there and so I think for me, um, I've had my own uh, consulting business for now 14 years, uh, has always been around um, creating culture, shared ownership, shared leadership, aligning, you know, executive teams that have their grand plans with the actual work and, um, but have also had time in major companies, um, some of the largest employers in the state of Pennsylvania, where I'm from, as well as helping companies of all facets in healthcare and technology, banking, uh, shipping, you name it. And it's always been about helping them get started often on their journeys, as well as figuring out, as Lindsay was talking about, how to adapt not only culture, but evolve business operating practices to allow these new and more practical ways of working to thrive and actually sustain and helping everyone kind of understand their role as shared um, leaders, not just by title, but just how to engage a culture. And so really, um, I would say passionate about creating something that is built into the organization rather than a series of initiatives that are trying to achieve, you know, achieve agile and inclusion and transformation and all these different things. And it's like, let's figure out how to kind of build it together and, and create that environment. Um, yeah, and have worked also on the tech side. So even though I, I'm an HR 
practitioner. I've, I've worked with plenty of product development and delivery teams, coaching and helping them with like, you know, moving from on-prem to the cloud and all that kind of stuff. So kind of busting out of a traditional career, we can talk about that later and kind of leveraging experience to help people with skills I don't have, you know, use them in a way that help them thrive. So that's something I'm very passionate about is helping other people achieve their, their greatness um, as best I can. So happy to be here. Awesome. I'm excited to see what you have to share. And again, I want to encourage everyone, uh, Cecilia, Stella, Michelle, PR, uh, this is a conversation. You have access to some brilliant agilists. Uh, use that time uh, to dive in. We've got three areas that we're roughly going to ask questions in, uh, focusing on the state of agility. Uh, you hear lots of things. You go on, on LinkedIn or Facebook. Scrum is dead. Agile is dead. No, it's not. Scrum's used all over the place or uh, Scrum and AI, all of this stuff. There's lots of things changing. Uh, we want to look at what, from the perspective of our panelists, is the state of agility and things that you need to be learning about, growing to build your career. We'll switch a little bit, talk about career tips and advice, and then just general challenges, things that... Uh, kind of opportunities for the Scrum world to get better. We're going to start with the state of agility. I'm going to start with Denise. Denise, you have experience. You range from military to major Fortune 100, 200 companies, some of the largest organizations in the world. With all of that experience, what trends or evolutions in Agile do you anticipate are going to emerge, are emerging uh, now and in the next few years? And how should organizations, and more importantly, to our learners especially, and to our, our participants from a early career individual uh, in the Agile space, early in the Agile space, what do we need to be learning and preparing so we can adapt for that? Thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And also thank you for all the kind words so far. I'm loving it. Um, so yeah, if I think about that, you're right. I've had a, a lot of different experiences. And what I see that's really emerging right now is that there's a really clear intersection I think between where agile and emerging tech, emerging technologies like Gen AI are converging. Um, I think it's a really exciting time, and we see it all in all over our social media and stuff. Um, I think it aligns with the trend towards like a more integrated and sophisticated digital environment, um, and that's very consistent with some of the work that I'm doing um, currently. But it also applies to the military and government, and I would say probably most other industries and companies as well. I mean, one of the things that kind of stands out is like we've all or may, you know, you may have heard like Bill Gates and others believe that Gen AI is like this huge transformative thing, like more um, transport transformative than like the Internet or the phone. And that really indicates um, a profound shift in the way that we're interacting with technology and, inter and information, really. Um, and what I'm seeing is that Gen AI is a, and new technology is a game changer in the context of business agility. I mean, we can create new content. It's quick, you know, easy to work with it. You can just have new images, audio, video, and it's all based on the patterns and the data that it's learning from. So I think if agile teams work with Gen AI well, um, we can leverage it for a lot of really neat things like, um, Rapid prototyping is one way that we're using it, or just even get inserting a lot of uh, new creativity, being more creative. I mean, as I mentioned, it's generating like new ideas and designs and solutions based on the things that we're teaching it. Um, we're also using it a lot for like data analysis, decision making. Um, so yeah, I would have to say using modern technologies in Gen AI and that intersection uh, with agility is the thing that comes to mind. Um, and as far as preparing for change, I mean, I'll start with the organizations and then we can talk about um, people. I would say that organizations looking to adapt and to use Gen AI, especially for their agile transformations is, and including like product management and innovation. I think that there's a whole bunch of different dimensions to this. I think that Gen AI initiatives have to be really, really carefully aligned with the organizational vision. Um, we have to invest in training, we have to invest in awareness. Um, and I think maybe the most critical thing to prepare for is um, data. So 
you know, Gen AI's outputs are only as good as the data you feed it. And so data quality and management are just so critical within all of these companies right now that are trying to have a, you know, have a digital transformation or be digital. And then a couple other things that I would say organizations should be preparing for is making sure that we're still focused on the human, human-centered design principles, for example, versus just reducing cost or efficiency um, with, with Gen AI. Like we really have to be careful with that. And I think we have to pick which pilot projects we want to experiment and kind of learn with. So in my role, we're ruthlessly prioritizing, which is great and a good thing if you're an agilist. Uh, but we are we're ruthlessly prioritizing which initiatives we want to focus on with Gen AI and some of these new um, tool sets that we have. And then more importantly, as you said, like what should people maybe new to their career or just entering um, the field of Agile think about when it comes to some of these new trends like uh, generative AI and modern technology? I'd say familiarize with it, like start to understand how people are using it. I mean, it's definitely not just with Agile you can use these tools for a whole bunch of different things. And it's it's the way of life going forward, I think. And so seeking out maybe some small certifications or, or reading about it online, I think understanding some of that and then knowing that, again, it's the data behind it that's so important. Um, and it's just a huge shift in the way that people are working right now. It's kind of new to a lot of people, so yeah. Yeah, I love that, Denise. And, and you can't escape Gen AI, and whether you think it is as big as the internet or not, it's here and it's not going anywhere. Um, what has been the most exciting thing with Gen AI? I want to ask a follow up. So, the most exciting thing you've seen with Gen AI that really makes you like, hey, I want that. And then the other side is what scares you the most about it? Mm, that's really good. <laughs> Um, I'll say personally, like I said, maybe it, maybe it's not what I'm doing at work because I'm actually not sure if I should cover some of those things. But the things that I really like about Gen AI are actually like some of the art. I don't know if you've seen some of the um, art that has been generated using AI. And I think that's kind of controversial as well. Like who gets the credit for that? Like, is it something that people can use whenever they want to, or is it patented or whatever? You know what I mean? So I think some of the really creative stuff that's happening in the world of art and Gen AI is very exciting. Um, but yeah, I use it every single day. I use Gen AI all the time and we, and we just are all the time. Um, and some of the things that scares me about that um, is just, it's only as good as what we teach it. And I think one of the topics you mentioned you wanted to cover today is kind of diversity and ethics and different perspectives. Um, so we have to be really careful about teaching AI to understand those things. Um, I think that's what scares me the most, Chris. Yeah, that's fair. AI by its nature is a bias engine. That's yeah, how it's designed is to be biased. That's how it learns. And so making sure that the data that we feed it is as fair and representative as we can is important. So I think that's good insight. Sora AI, have you seen any of the videos that Sora, which is the new video thing? It's fascinating, terrifying, and I can't wait to see it. <laughs> and it's also absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, we could talk about AI the whole time, I think, Chris. Like, there's just so much to explore there. That's why I think it's one of the biggest trends, and we should look at it more how, how we can use it um well, can I tag into like yeah, it's making please. me think yeah I'm just like you said jump in Chris so we're jumping in I it's it's an interesting thing it's just like for those of us who started their careers you know before 2000 I won't claim anyone else other than myself but you know back when I got my first you know email address and then the company I worked for out of college you know we were doing reverse auction technology and people were coming behind our firewall and sharing all this purchasing data. And this was in the late nineties, early two, and it was so disruptive. And, you know, people were so afraid of what we were doing and we were making up new job titles. Like no one knew what a market maker was. And we, you know, like it was just, you know, we were called people development back in 1999. That was my first job out of college. And I think much like AI, it's these new technology, new ways of working, new ways of trying to do things has always been, scary and even, you know, take it back a couple of steps with, you know, RPA technology, right? I've had some experience with that and people being very afraid of, 
Well, that was my job. And I think that with any of these new technologies, mm -hmm. you know, organizations are well served with, you know, changing. We see this in the agile transformation too with my job used to be a manager feeding work to people and telling them what to do. Like, what is my job now? And I'm terrified of that change. So I think it's, it's interesting to hear Denise talk about it, that harnessing the good, but then being a responsible adult to make sure it's used for good purposes and having the courage to kind of lead and be the voice to say is, you know, nope, that's too far. Right. And, and I'm sure the panel has seen this with agile teams and scrum teams. Like you start to get people who are very defensive and will say, you know, leave the team alone or you're not allowed to talk to us. And it becomes this almost anarchist movement. You're like, oh gosh, wait a minute. How do we dial that back and, and, and wrestle with it? So I, I feel like, you know, as we move forward with the state of it is, is there's always going to be noise, whatever, is happening in the world of work. There's always going to be noise and it's rooted in my estimation in just fear. You know, we all worry about, you know, failing. I feel like it's not fear of change it's as much as I don't want to mess this up because I have a family, I have responsibilities, I have things I care about, uh, or I've invested my whole, my whole career in this and now you're changing it. Does that mean what I did doesn't matter anymore? So I just, I feel like, you know, it's always, there's always noise. You know, if you talk to you, if your grandparents or parents are still with you, you know, they'll talk about the noise of the change in their workplaces too. So I think it's reminding ourselves like this isn't the first time that the world of work has changed, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally does. Thanks. That's a really good ad. One of my favorite analogies goes back to the monks that were really, really upset around the printing press because they were mm -hmm. the best way of writing the Bible down. But when the printing press came out, there was a better way. And they didn't like it and they were very upset about it um i kind of view the same kind of thing it's going to change there are lots of issues with it and we absolutely have to be aware and wise about that Lindsay, from your perspective uh, i want to shift the question just a little bit kind of back up uh to the broader agile space what's the single most critical factor that organizations need to focus on to be able to fully leverage agile all of this changes in technology, what's the most important thing organizations should be looking at in that area? Oh, well, I think, so I'm gonna do that that um, clear agile thing of like, it depends, right? <laughs> the good old phrase there. Um, but I'm gonna bring it back to the fact that I think the most important thing when you've got a company or a team or whomever that's looking to sort of make a change is to make the change based on what their needs are and not make the change based on all of the noise that they hear around, right? So um, I think a lot of times when you've got people who are going into trying something new, right? They want to take a blueprint or they want to take an outline and they want to say, okay, well, this is what worked for them. And so that's what we're going to do. And there's definitely a lot of validity around taking ideas from other people, right? <laughs> there are realistically at this point in time, outside of maybe Gen, I, Gen AI, there are no new ideas. Everything is a rehashing of something in some way, shape or form. Um, and it's great to beg, borrow, and steal and to be able to try some things that maybe you didn't think of or or that are new to you. Um, but I think a lot of times people look at something and they say, okay, well, that's a blueprint. And that was a blueprint of success for X, Y, or Z company. And so my ABC company is going to be able to do that same thing. And when you use that sort of copy and paste methodology, you strip away the uniqueness of what makes that organization that organization. And um, it can become very restrictive and very much a, you know, another box that we're just trying to put people in, right? Um, and so a lot, a lot of when it comes to looking and building a transformation and trying to figure out what good looks like, it's not what does good look like from an agile lens or what does good look like from a scrum or a Kanban or whatever framework you might be using to kind of implement your change. To me, it's always, okay, well, what does good look like for X company? Um, and what are the big things that they're facing currently that we can help to address through some of the changes that we're looking to make? Um, and then I think when you start to partner that concept of 
personalized but informed decision making around what that change is going to be. And then you partner that with very transparent and realistic expectations. I can't tell you how many times in my career I have told people there is no light switch, right? You cannot, you cannot expect to move a mountain in a day. And when you're talking about anything from the standpoint of change, it is going to take time for people to be able to understand the long-term implications, to be able to understand the short-term impacts, just to be able to get their feet wrapped around some solid ground. Um, and that's one of the things I don't think we account for enough when we're talking about change in general is just that we look at this as a very linear timeline of like, okay, well, we change and then we changed. And there's not this thought process of like, no, it's a ramp, right? It's, it's a gradient. And not only is it a ramp or a gradient, but it's a gradient with like so many shades of gray that we have to be very, very explicit and understanding that those gray shades are gonna come and go and be all kinds of different disruptive at different points in time. Um, and that can be incredibly frustrating on all sides of the equation, right? Not only from people trying to impact that change because you're trying to fight against this wave of, <clears throat> I'll, I'll pull that back. I always refer to myself as a gardener, okay? So when I say that I'm a gardener, what I say is that I plant seeds every single day. Some of those seeds are going to grow in two weeks and some of them are going to grow in six and some of them won't grow for four years. And so the biggest thing that I have to be cognizant of is the patience and the diligence to keep planting and to keep watering and to know that maybe not all of those seeds are going to sprout and come to fruition, but that if I get 80% of them doing a damn good job, right? And I can be really proud of myself for that. Um, and so that from a change individual standpoint, I think is the hardest. And also from the standpoint of those being impacted because they also have to have that same patience and they don't have the same skin in the game, right? It's just a different level. And so they're trying to be as minimally impacted by this change a little bit at a time so that it's not so overwhelming and they don't have to put up their defense mechanisms and they don't have to feel like, I call it weaponized agility, right? Where people say, oh, that's not agile. No, okay, let's take a step back and let's try to triage what the issue is and not just draw that line in the sand and say something is or isn't. And trying to sort of meld all that together and to get in there with so many different personalities and so many different backgrounds and having the ability to just kind of like, all right, what can we do now? What can we impact now? What can we focus on now? And then let's focus on that. And then let's take it sort of chunk by chunk um, and not try to digest the whole elephant in one fell swoop, um, I think is really sort of the second portion of that, right? So you got to look at overall what the company needs and then B, partner that with the patience and the understanding and the just breathing, right? Breathing through it a little bit sometimes to say that like, we're gonna get there, but we're gonna have to trudge a little bit to make that happen. And sometimes it's gonna feel kind of crummy and that's okay. Absolutely okay, we need to validate that. And then we just move forward. I love that. And I love that analogy of the gardener. You're the second person I know to have used that. Uh, one of our previous panels, Saronia uh, Mbaka, uh, that was her analogy of cultivating and, and being a gardener, uh, an agile gardener. I think that's a great, perspective on it. And also, if I had to be a real gardener, if 1% of my plants uh, survived, I would be doing well. I would be very proud. Uh, my, you're yeah. real lucky that these things are alive and this one's doing a real, it's rough right now. So. <laughs> yeah, I've got one over there that's in the same state. Uh, we moved and uh, the poor thing. It, yeah, uh, my thumb is very, my green thumb is very brown. Uh, <laughs> All right, I wanna move on a little bit and let's focus a little bit on career tips. Uh, thinking back, uh, you're all accomplished agilists with lots of different perspectives and different jobs and roles within the agile space, uh, from leading coaching to from coaching and training to leading and executing, uh, all have very different perspectives. Uh, 
in experience. So let's talk about that a little bit. I want to start with Beth, uh, especially with your focus on Scrum and HR and that perspective around bringing uh, those skills and looking at agility through there. Uh, what strategies would you recommend that you've learned through all of those skills and experience with doing Scrum and Agile and HR? What strategy would you recommend? Again, I'm going to split it like I did with Denise. One for organizations and uh -huh. two for uh, the person, the practitioner, the person doing the work. Yeah. I'll, I'll maybe reverse it and start with the practitioner just because I feel like the thing that I somehow learned very early on um, was to be very open and curious. And I think it was just how I was raised was to not limit myself because of where I came from or, you know, that I was a girl at the time, you know, whatever it was, I just was always like, okay, like somebody needs to learn that, or that's important work that needs to get done. I'll do it. I'll learn it. Um, and I think back to early career experiences that I've had where like someone's got to figure this. We had a, a big, um, um, for national population in our workforce, this was late nineties. And we were spending a lot of money on attorney fees. And it was like, someone's got to learn more about h one b visas and it's like 23. And I was like, I'll do it. And I think that is such a good attitude as I've moved into a very winding career path. Like, you know, if, if you want to say that it's been mostly in HR, that's fine, but it hasn't. And I think it's not unless it matters to you, I guess I'll caveat that. If it matters to you, right, you're pursuing a professional credential. I love that, right? You know, and and, and you're pursuing mastery of something that's amazing. Um, my attitude was always, I don't care what my job title is. As long as the work is interesting, I'm doing something useful in the world and I'm getting paid a fair living wage to do it and no one's treating me bad, I'm in. And I feel like find, being discerning um, as I got into my career of, being okay with saying no to certain things um, have helped me then work with organizations who are trying to enact change because you you have to, at least for me, find your your guiding principles, you know, the things that you you stand for. Because, you know, what's the phrase? If you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. And I think that can happen in the agile space where there is again that noise and people feeding you things of like you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. And it turns people away because they're trying to learn and, and be curious and ask questions. And I feel like when organizations can, and any company I've ever worked with, I hope um, that they would back me up on this, is if you haven't figured out your purpose, your mission, or how to distill down your 6,000 goals and objectives as an organization, don't start trying to change the way you're working because you're just going to stress people out even more. And then that leads to your, we can't attract talent. Like if anyone tells me there's a war for talent, I'm going to throw up on them. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I'm so sick of hearing. There's been a war for talent for the 25 years I've been in the workforce. Like let's get over it, people. We have to look in the mirror, I think, and say, what are we doing to make it easy for people to want to join our company, to share their time and talents with us? And then when they leave, because guess what? They're going to leave. Like I've worked for so many companies, but you speak well of the experiences and you say, you know what, Lindsay, that's a great place. You would love it there, you know, versus spending all this time in drama. So I feel like for me, from a career perspective, it's, it's finding a place where you can do good work, be with people that are going to lift you up and make you better, um, challenge you, right? Call you out on the stuff that are your kind of things. I mean, trust me, the person I am today was not who I was. 25 years ago, right? I had some sharp edges I had to learn to get over myself. But I think the agile ways of working, if you can model that empathy, compassion, but also challenging people, you know, and helping them raise their own bars so that they can succeed. Those are the things that I, that I think have served me well um, and learning how to check down my ego. Um, it's been a lifelong thing for me because I'm passionate, but learning how to watch others thrive and succeed. I think for organizations, you have to want your people, you have to want the empowerment and you have to want the um, success for your people more than you want your own success. And I think if you are focused too much on, you know, yes, there's shareholders, yes, there's bonuses to be paid, but if you're too focused on that, I don't care what you're trying to do. You're, you're never going to get the benefits of these different new ways of working. If you're too focused on 
bottom line profits and who's getting promoted. You know, I just think some of those things don't always mesh well in an agile org. So sorry, I took that a little, little winding road, but those are things I think that in my 25 years of doing work has, has helped me stay sane and hopefully do some good in the world. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's, let's, I, I, I think actually, and actually, yeah, let's take it. I want to spend a little more time on this topic. And, and Beth, that one, you said something there that, you know, as someone that is trying to recruit talent, uh, trying to recruit developers that look, don't complain about not being able to do it, but what are you doing to make it easy? I think that resonated uh, with me. And so thank you for that. That's something I'm going to take back to my team. What are we doing to make it easy uh, for people to engage? And then finding someone you, something you love doing, making it enjoyable, no matter what the job title is, doing good wherever you find yourself. I think that's a just such a great insight. Uh, Denise, on your journey, you made lots of decisions, lots of moments in your life that defined your career and where you are today. What were some of those key moments that brought you to where you are and, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, before I jump into that, though, I just have to say, Beth, like, I love that you empathize finding your own passion and defining your values. Chris, that's part of the mindset thing. And I think Lindsay even said breathe, <laughs> like all of those things are what I'm talking about when I when I said mindset. Um, total, totally agree on finding your own passion and defining your values. And then I just want to add one thing on that, which is um, I think it's doing the things that actually make you uncomfortable and being really curious. Um, so that that's definitely something that I've done in my career, even if I didn't feel ready or wasn't sure if I had the right credentials or certifications, or if I was the youngest person in the room or whatever the thing is, um, I think doing things that make you uncomfortable is where you really learn. And that has definitely shaped my career. Um, if I look back, then I would also say that moving back and forth between different sectors, um, you know, working in the government and then switching and working at a company that's, you know, building trains or doing different, you know, things that are very different. Um, that's really helped because it's given me a, just a very broad view. It's, I'm, um, you know, you specialize in certain things and you want to be an expert and learn and be able to teach and do certain things. But also that translates a lot across a lot of different industries and companies and just kind of seeing how, you know, the tech and finance industry does things versus the supply chain or the military, there's still commonalities there. Uh, but I do think that leaving jobs is difficult and also very rewarding because you learn so much more about, you know, how this other company is doing or what not to do or how it applies, you know, to a different problem set. Um, I think those are the things that have really shaped my career is kind of like making sure I'm sticking to my values and the things that are important to me where I am passionate. Um, and then taking those leaps, doing the really uncomfortable things uh, where you actually learn the most and then just kind of not keeping it constant and the same all the time, sort of seeking out change and different opportunities. That uh, do things that make you uncomfortable. I was talking to a high school student on Monday and he was looking for advice. That was the number one thing I'd say is like every single day, find something that makes you so uncomfortable and do it anyway. And that'll be where you grow. And that I think that's great uh, insight there, Denise. Thanks. What yeah, and then the... build confidence too, because it's like you do one little thing that makes you uncomfortable. And then guess what? You did that and you can do another thing that makes you uncomfortable. So yeah. awesome, Chris. That is good advice for sure. Yeah, good insight. Lindsay, you're big on mentorship and have a lot to say about mentorship in your career. It's such a vital thing. What is your approach to finding a mentor, working with mentors, or being a mentor, or and being a mentor? Um, so generally speaking, when I look at mentorship, I want to find somebody or I want someone to find me who understands me. I think one of the things about mentorship that can be difficult is that you find somebody who um, maybe is an aspiration of what maybe the work is that you want to do or something along those lines. And that doesn't necessarily jive with who you are. So in my experience, the most prominent and poignant mentors that I've had 
have been individuals who haven't necessarily been where I wanted to be from a career standpoint, but have pushed me to be unapologetically Lindsay in every aspect of who I am and have pushed me when I've been questioning that to say, take a step, take a breath. And does that feedback align with how you see yourself and who you want to be as a worker and as a person? And that is the type of mentor that I want to be to others as well. So if I have individuals who want <clears throat> to come to me for advice, I don't necessarily look at someone and say, oh, you're looking to be an agile coach or you're looking to get into that community, but it's more so what are you trying to get out from yourself, right? Who are you trying to be? Um, and I think that's the critical thing because I'm not saying it's bad to look at somebody who say you want to be a CFO and you want a mentor who's a CFO it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a poor choice. But I think you have to find somebody who pushes you to be you and not just another version of them. Because everyone's career paths and trajectories are different in the same way that every organization is different, right? You can't carbon copy something and say, because it worked for Jim, that it's going to work for Joe or it's going to work for Stacy. Um, and so when I approach mentorship in any capacity, it's always you know, when I'm talking to this person, when we're having conversations, how are we talking about what's going on? Are we talking about, you know, pushing me outside of my comfort zone? Are we talking about um, the feedback I'm receiving and how that does or does not align with my core values as who I am as a person and a worker? Are we talking about what I can be looking at from a more holistic view of expanding my own inherent biases to be able to get me out of my own head and try to be able to see differing perspectives that I just don't have because of the fact that I am a cis white woman who has had this experience in my life and I need to be able to broaden that perspective. Um, and so to me, mentorship is much more of than just finding somebody who has a role that I wanna have and much more about finding somebody who is going to push me to be the best version of Lindsay that I can possibly be. And I wanna do that same thing for other people in that same capacity. Uh, love that. Finding someone that pushes you to be the best version of yourself. That's, I, I, uh, I found mentors that wanted me to be carbon copies of them and it doesn't work out in the long run. Um, we end up butting heads a lot. And I would say to that, if you're early in your career, like huge, because I don't know about anyone else, but you can waste a lot of time in your adult life trying to fit in and trying yeah. to like be those carbon copies. And like you get some success, like I'm not saying it won't work out, but you get to a certain age and you realize, wow, um, I'm not as happy as I thought I would be once I got to this level and got this paycheck or whatever. And you start to realize like, oh, darn, like <laughs> I, I forgot about me in this journey. So um, I think the sooner you can, I love that, find those people. And I might add, Lindsay, too, like I have found as I've gotten older um, that having multi-generational workforce, like my mother is still 70, is 77 and she still works full time. So, right, she's the work grandma at her workplace and she loves it and she's interacting with young, very young people that are younger than even my kids are. And, um, and, you know, being a Gen Xer and, you know, and just having all of those different influences, I think is cool, right. From a mentoring standpoint, not being like, well, because you're older, you are the mentor. It's like, no, no, I need a 23 year old mentor. Cause I'm struggling to relate right now or whatever it looks like. And so I think I love what you said. It's like finding people you know, when, when my 20 year old challenges me in my mindset, you know, it's easy to get frustrated, but then it's like, well, wait a minute, they're the next generation that are going to take over the reins in the workforce and be the caregivers and the leaders. And so like, how can I learn from what they're seeing that is different than my 77 year old mother, who's also in the workplace and respecting that. And so I feel like Lindsay with mentoring, like you said, it's like finding people who, who point out the things about you that aren't like always your best self either too and that are willing to help you see like 
better choices that you can make. So I just want to thank you for that. It just sparked for me like, oh yeah, that's why when I feel uncomfortable when a 20 year old tells me something that they don't like, it's not because they don't like you. It's that there's something that they're experiencing that isn't helpful and they want to help you. And the other side is they could just not tell you. I'll, I'll say growing a business, finding a 20 year old to help you navigate social media, even with someone that like was born, was raised on social. I was there when it started back in the 3000 years ago when social media started. Now I kind of need that 20 year old to tell me how the heck can I be cool on social media? Cause I don't have to do that. <laughs> So I want to give a little bit for Stella, Cecilia, PR, Michelle. Uh, I've got some more questions here and I would like to get to them, but more important, I want to open the floor and see if y'all have any questions or thoughts or comments you would like to bring to the table. Not at this time, actually. I'm, I'm a beginner and, uh, you know, virtual assistants and the, you know, the agile and the scrum. I am actually beginning. And so I have taken some classes uh, on last year, and, you know, and but at during that time, of course, I'm still in the learning stage. So at this moment, I'm just enjoying just listening to all of you and just sharing your experiences. Thank you. Awesome. Love that you're you're making that that leap out. Have you signed up for the Level Up program? Did I remember that? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I don't you think do, uh, so. I will make sure you get information on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what about Stella, uh, Cecilia, Michelle? I have a question. Um, I am also a beginner. I'm currently in university, so I'm just trying to get a little bit ahead right now. But one thing that I've noticed in my experience going through trying to get towards a role in production or project management is... Um, the imposter syndrome, especially because a lot of people ask, okay, what was your current experience in this field? I'm working towards working in games. So a game producer or project manager. And a lot of those companies specifically always ask, what was your current ex or your previous experience at a company that you worked at? And I'm like, I didn't work at a company previously. I've been studying up until this point. Or the experience that I have at university, while I feel like is good experience, while other people have told me is good experience, I also feel like isn't enough. <laughs> so just kind of dealing with that imposter syndrome. I, I'll jump in first just because I'll share. I, publicly, I don't care. I'm, I've been off work for almost a year recovering from some, some spinal surgeries. And I recently had imposter syndrome. Uh, I mentioned to the panel before we got on about, gosh, I've been out of it for a year, you know, and just coming back in to say like, am I still, do I still know anything? Am I still relevant? And does it still matter? But also I shared with Chris and the panel, you know, being someone who's been trying to break out of the HR space, Stella and group, like to say that I have more to offer than that title has been difficult. And I remember when I got my first gig, um, being a scrum master and coach, agile coach to product, product management teams and software developers and being like, what? in the heck do I even know? Like, I know I know stuff and I know I can be helpful, but this is scary. Um, and so it's real and and I still fight it. You know, I've, I've been reaching out for jobs even today with all my experience and having folks be like, no, no thanks. You know, you seem more like this or more like that. And so I think to what Lindsay and Denise have both said, it's like, you've got to figure out like, you got to find your people. And, and it, it is very hard because even for me, like I just got another rejection email today and it was like, really? Like, God, that hurts. you know, and then I'm like, well, no, you know, what if someone say rejection is protection? So maybe those rejections are protecting you from something that wasn't going to be good for your journey. So, um, but it's, it's, it's real. Um, and I think you're, you know, you just have to be clear about what you've done and, you know, I'm sure Lindsay and Denise will say the same thing, like reach out to us, you know, after this, because if, you know, if you're like, Hey, I'm, I don't know how to position this so that someone would actually pay attention. There's a lot of people out in the world that want to help others land. So um, I would offer that Lindsay, I see you. So I'm going to toss the ball to you. Yeah. And I think I'm just going to piggyback. I, I think, you know, what Beth is saying is, is right on the nail. Um, that's not that saying, but you know, we'll go with it in this context. I've already finished my coffee, need another round apparently. Um, 
you don't know what you don't know, right? And I think people really, as much as we think that people want us to have all of the answers for things all of the time, I think being able to say when you're going into an interview or having, you know, looking for an internship, whatever it is that you're looking for from a next step standpoint, you have to be able to be confident in what you have done, but then also be able to say, I've got so much learning to do. And this is why I'm excited for this opportunity, because I will be able to look at X, Y, and Z and be engaged in these different facets. And it goes a long way when <laughs> in any facet of your life to be able to just openly and honestly say, hey, I don't know, right? That's, that's not something I've experienced yet, but you know what? I'm really looking forward to it. And I'd love to be able to, you know, figure out what that looks like and then help somebody else in my kind of shoes to be able to delve through that. I'm a great solution or I'm a great at this, that, and the other that'll be able to help me in those different areas. Um, because, you know, sometimes we are our own worst enemy and we just, that ego and that self-doubt and that imposter syndrome and all of that stuff kind of creates this chaotic ball of whatever in us that makes us go, Ugh. Um, but realistically, we don't have to know all the answers. I can guarantee you there are millions of board executives and CEOs and CFOs and all of the letters, right? That don't necessarily have all the answers, but they have the wherewithal to be able to say, you know what, I don't know. So let me tap into those resources that do have the answer and that might be closer to it than I am and that we can figure out what the best passport forward is. And again, just being able to say that out loud is 99% of it, right? You just have to be able to say those words. I don't know, but I'll, but I'll circle back with you. Um, and so just let yourself sit in the fact that you don't have to have all the answers, especially at 20 years old or however old you are just coming out of university, but you're, you're just starting, right? allow yourself that ability to be like, yes, I'm so excited for what I've learned, but I'm also so excited that my pot's only 20% full. And I've got all of this additional space to be able to learn all of these new things. Thanks, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I just put some stuff in chat because I know we're running low on time. I feel like I could talk about this forever. First of all, everyone has imposter syndrome at some point. It's Every single person, even if they're super educated, have held 50 different jobs, like you still feel like that and you have to kind of work through that and figure figure out ways to bring yourself. So I, I think in the chat, I said, you are enough. And that's true. Like you, every single person brings so much to the table with just where they're at today. Um, and I think the other thing is kind of same old thinking, same old results. Like we need fresh ideas. We need people who have learned new, more modern technologies. We need you. Um, so don't forget that and sell it <laughs> in these interviews. I mean, we're always looking for new talent and um, yeah, so keep keep it going and good luck to you and definitely connect with all the people on this panel as well. Maybe we can help you sometime. Such, yeah, strong stuff. Cecilia, anything you would like to ask, Michelle? Um, nothing to ask. I just, there was a lot of like, I aha moments during this where I was just like just reminders of what I could be doing or just and there was one point where I think one of the uh, speakers mentioned about being that person who's always just like I could do it you know I could do it and taking on those things but now I'm starting to come to the point where I am that person who everybody's just like Cecilia can get it done and so but I'm also kind of struggling with like all right everybody I need you all to back up I, my list is starting to get full and so trying to also manage those expectations but also being kind of that, you know, that person that everybody can count on. So, you know, I don't know if anybody has something to say about that, but that's where I'm struggling right now because I am, you know, after doing that training, I am becoming more proficient of managing my time and being able to take on more things because, you know, I am, you know, a better project manager, but I'm also struggling with people wanting to throw so much on my plate because I'm becoming so efficient at what I'm doing. I think that's a whole other topic series we could all talk a lot about because I think I, I see Denise smiling. Everyone's smiling. like we've all been there because that's what happens. Um, but maybe the one thing I'd say before we close on that is is great opportunity to start teaching others, Cecilia, right? And developing talent. That's being a leader uh, and you know helping other people learn and grow and not just saying like 
go take a class, you know, and just sharing your knowledge and bringing people beside you to say, do you want to, like, why don't you come here? I'll teach you. And finding focus is, I always say focus is your friend. So, you know, being very clear on what matters most, but also using opportunities to say like, I can't take that on right now, but like, I would happily teach you how to do it. Let's book some time. I know that sounds easier said than done in the busy madness of work, but I think it's an opportunity for you to continue to distinguish yourself by developing other talent while you're doing your success as well. I think people respect you for saying no. I mean, it's great that people are coming to you. It sounds like you're doing really well and you've developed a lot of knowledge and expertise and there's lots of ways to handle all of their quests. But in the end, like I think people who prioritize the most in work, most important work and can articulate that, like I'd love to help you, but here's the other things that I have prioritized and here's what the, the value proposition is or whatever. And really evaluating and thinking about the things that you spend your time on, that's really important. Um, and I think people will actually respect you for saying no, if you are careful about it and manage that, you know, conversation well. And I just want to piggyback on Beth. I, I use this uh, story all the time. I left a job once because I had a manager who told me a sentence that was, it would take me 28 minutes to do it myself and 30 minutes to show you how. And I started applying for new roles that same day. And I think about that every single time that I do anything in my career is I don't want to be that person. And so whenever I think about taking on something else or um, <clears throat> feeling overwhelmed or swamping myself, I think back to, am I becoming that person because it would take me 28 minutes to do it myself and 30 minutes to show somebody else. Um, and sometimes that helps me just kind of step back and reprioritize and say no when I need to say no and tap into other people and start to kind of build that sharing of knowledge, right? And we always get to that T-shaped people conversation, building those T-shaped people. Um, and it's, I just, again, I use that story all the time, but I even get a little choked up when I talk about it because it's literally in the back of my head every single day, every single time I take something on, I go, am I becoming that person that is just all doing it myself? and not building my network and building that skill set of people and building this, this amazing place so that when I win the lottery tomorrow, it's a billion dollars, something like that, right? When I win the lottery, that somebody else can take, take the reins and there's not this sort of collapse and there's no single person risk that's sort of associated with what's going on. Such, such value in this webinar. I want to thank everyone for showing. I want to thank uh, Denise, Lindsay, and Beth for uh, investing their time in uh, each one of you as participants in this. I hope to see you. I, I see some interest in our programs. Michelle, PR, check out uh, the Agile Accelerator. Check out our Level Up Scholarship. This is what we're about at Kabu, uh, and this is why we exist, helping the, the kinds of things that uh, our panels were talking about. It's so much fun to do. It's so much fun and an honor to be a part of this kind of work within organizations, making places people love to come to work. Uh, we're honored to be able to do that. And you could uh, bring insight into that. It's time. We are at our time box, a little bit actually over our time box. So I want to be a good agilist and honor our time box. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you next time in your next step on your agile journey.